Good evening. Welcome to our final College of Architecture and Design lecture of this academic year. Wow, time flies. Uh, before I pass the mic over to our Dean, Carl Daubman, to introduce our speaker for this evening, I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to acknowledge some of the exceptional students in our community who are being uh, recognized and inducted into a National Honor Society. And this is the Tau Sigma Delta, which you've seen this slide here for a few minutes and you've all memorized it. But it is in fact the only honor society that's nationally recognized for architecture and the allied arts in the United States. And so it's a great privilege to have a chapter here at Lawrence Tech and to be able to find students every year who meet the very high mark, academic mark, to be able to join the society. And so what I would like to do is, here are the individuals who are being recognized this year. The recognition is based on very high academic standards and the students have to be within the top 20% of their class. If we have any of these students here, I know some are at work and some are in class, if you could please stand. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome them into the society and look forward to watching their achievements as they go forward in their education and professional careers. So congratulations. And now Carl, if you would like to take the mic. Thank you. Good evening, thank you Deirdre. My name is Carl Dobman and I'm the Dean of the College of Architecture and Design. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our final lecture, I know you just said this too, of the spring 2018 semester. Tonight we welcome Lois Weinthal from Ryerson University. It's been a busy semester in which we've had a very full lecture program with lectures from designers, game artists, architects, researchers, and landscape architects to name a few. The range of speakers maps to the broad range of degrees within the College of Architecture and Design. In the college we go through various scales. We operate at the scale of games, products, identity, cars, interiors, buildings, and cities. <coughs> the range is exciting because there's so many new and exciting activities emerging in the disciplinary gaps. It's important for me to mention this range because our speaker tonight operates in these spaces between disciplines. She's able to capture disciplinary knowledge from one group and apply it to another. Lois Weinthal holds a Bachelor of Architecture from RISD and a Master of Architecture from Cranbrook. Lois is a professor in interior design and the chair of the School of Interior Design at Ryerson University. Previously, she was the director of the interior design program at Parsons the New School for Design, and Graduate Advisor for the Masters of Interior Design program in the School of Architecture at the University of Texas at Austin. Lois's book, this book, which you guys should have. I can get a cut, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Lois edited the book, Toward a New Interior, an anthology of interior design theory. The first sentence of the book states, interior design literature is in need of theoretical framing. That's an ambitious declaration. This is, this is a very important book and it delivers on that ambition. The book maps out eight different territories, some of which include body and perception, clothing and identity, and bridging interior and exterior. Lois's specific contribution to the book in her essay entitled Corners and Darts. She explores techniques from fashion design to reinvent the way that we think about the elemental aspect or the very simple aspect of turning a corner with architectural materials. 
She also explores the disciplines that operate at full scale, like fashion and furniture, in comparison to those that work at other scales, like interiors and architecture. Her essay elegantly maps out the investigation of one disciplinary technique and its deployment in another. Her work of bridging a theoretical framework to interiors continues with her work as co-editor of Aftertaste, Expanded Practice in Interior Design, which began as a series of symposia to address the interdisciplinary nature of interiors and the tangent disciplines that affect and inform it. I got to know Lois through a recent symposium that she hosted at Ryerson called Object, Body, and Closure, which will have yet another output from that, which looks at the transformative effects of fabrication on interiors. We're so lucky to have Lois with us today, especially because she's on sabbatical. So help me welcome Lois to LTU. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, if for some reason you can't hear me, just somebody wave or let me know and I'll talk a little bit louder. Um, but it's really a pleasure to be back here. I've been here a few times now and every time I see things changing here, like it's, something's constantly changing. So it's really wonderful um, to, and hopefully I'll see it in a few more years again. So I'm just gonna flip through a few slides that I know are really important for those of you doing anything AIA related. Um, some objectives that I will cover. There will not be a quiz afterwards. <laughs> Maybe for the faculty there will be. <laughs> it's probably the right way to do it. But this talk is really titled, not objectives for AIA, <laughs> but Wrinkles and Folds, the Strata of Interiors. And where this title came from stems from this quote, and there's a few things that are found in that theory book that Carl nicely held up um, that kind of follow me around even after many years. And so they're peppered throughout this presentation only because they've acted as springboards for new areas to look at. And one of these pieces that is a carryover from that is this quote by the French philosopher Michel Serres who writes, the number of layers, strata, and partitions from rough concrete to bed linen, the number of skins until we reach our real skin. And so for me that, you know, quote's kind of been sitting in the background for a long time while we've been busy doing other things, but it does summarize a lot of the things that I think are important to interiors. Um, it names some in areas that we occupy, our, you know, skin, bed linens, um, we're surrounded by concrete, but at the same time, Sarah's does something really smart, which is he talks about it as strata. And when we think about strata, he's suddenly jumping to the geological scale. And when we think of the geological scale, we can think of that, I mean, for me, I remember learning about core samples. I don't know if, if anybody or everybody here has learned about core samples, but to me, the concept of a core sample is really important because it helps frame a lens for how we look at things. So a core sample, you know, it's a, um, what they use to understand the soil, so that way when a building has to have the foundation design, they understand what type of foundation is needed. So it can go down, you know, hundreds of feet, thousands of feet, it all depends upon what they're looking at. And what I like about that is it gives a conceptual lens for looking at many layers, but at the same time, Sarah's is talking about layers that we think of as, you know, the skin, bed linen, concrete, almost in a horizontal direction. So these are a few things that I'm going to start moving through the lecture with, um, and they'll pop up in various ways, and I couldn't help but show a few examples of core samples just to help <laughs> give it some visualization. And what you're seeing on the left are just a few, you know, real samples that the USGS um, has in a, you know, all different areas. But it shows different sample types of soil. And then off to the right, they provide a few nice diagrams that show, you know, this is the process of boring through, but also a little diagram that shows the strata of different soil samples. And it talks about that depth, about taking a snapshot through the soil. So what I would like to do, since, since I have the liberty, I'm not fighting gravity on this, I decided to make my own little diagram, and just to help, um, you would never really see this in a construction document, but hopefully it'll help explain a point here, which is when we think about that core sample as a lens into the soil, what I'd like to do is think of that as moving up vertically through the structure and capturing another set of information. 
So that's one piece that I think that lens of a core sample provides. But at the same time, I've also added one that rotates it so it's horizontal, a little bit like what Michelle Serres is talking about. So if you'll bear with me for a minute, I would just like to read a, a short um, piece that I wrote for a book that was recently published by some of my colleagues titled Interiors Beyond Architecture. And it just helps frame the way I'm looking at this because it'll start showing up at other places along the lecture. So what I'd like to do is explain it by writing where I wrote, to extract and analyze, such as the core sample, helps bring, cl bring clarity to a greater whole by viewing the parts. Whether it be soil in a core sample to understand a building's foundation or text from a narrative that gives hint at a larger story. The space of interiors is often viewed as part of an architectural whole. If architecture can be seen as the shell that contains the interior, then each interior can be extracted and analyzed independently. We do not often think of the interior as a core sample the way we do a soil sample. But if we could extract a hypothetical core sample that extends up from the soil and through the height of a building, the sample would reveal a set of relationships that include tectonics, some thick, like a concrete foundation, and some thin, like veneer finishes, along with voids both small, such as the space between joists, and large, like the full height of a room. This is only a sample of building forms that would be revealed and placed in equal standing to one another through this objective lens. The remainder of what exists outside of that lens would reveal a fuller picture of the interior, such as program, occupancy, materials, and the temporal nature of the ever-changing interior scape. The peripheral view from the core sample is where the analysis of the physical composition ends and the theoretical complexity of the interior reveals change faster than settling soil. So with that, I'd like to carry some of those ideas maybe into a simpler diagram. And this diagram comes from the theory book, and usually it has other pieces of information um, supporting it, but I wanted to look at this lens that I provided through the writing of Sarah's and trying to bring over some of the terminologies he's using into this diagram. And so the diagram is originally set up to think about the center part as the core, is where the person is located. So it has a very humanist um, perspective. So if you think of the body at the center and all the layers that we occupy surrounding us, we could think of the center as where our skin is. And then just building up on Sarah's reference to the bedroom, thinking about things like where feathers show up, maybe in pillows, a comforter, um, bed linens. As you begin to move further out, you know, maybe along that core sample, you start running into elements like upholstery, curtain, curtains, and then finally into surfaces that are a bit more static, that don't move, like plaster, wood lathe, um, brick or concrete. And then at the top of that diagram, I've included a few words, um, almost like attributes, and they don't neatly fall in a very kind of stacked order. And that's because they transcend all of those areas. So we could think about time as spanning from concrete to the body, or craft or the gaze. So with that diagram, there's even another subtext to it. The top one, as I just mentioned, are attributes that transcend boundaries. But at the bottom layer, as we work through those nameable, tangible pieces, the ones that are closest to the body are the ones that are typically more flexible. Whereas the ones that start moving out towards brick and concrete are more static. And that's where I think it becomes interesting to think about the space of interiors where things are more flexible at the scale that we work at in interiors. It's always about these soft materials, sometimes hard materials, but the softer ones are a little bit harder to grasp because something's always moving. And that's where it becomes complicated when one wants to start measuring them, putting them into some form of construction document that captures them. A construction document is meant to be things that show um, construction that transcends over a greater period of time. It doesn't show the movement of a curtain or the, you know, the changing of a bed, but those are things that I think could be slipped into construction documents. And so that's where this idea about how do we start documenting things that are more flexible in a way that can find their way 
into construction documents. To me, I always see them as the test of how we occupy things or how we are going to build things so they can be occupied. And I also like to test that ground and say where there's slippages, where can things you know, change in that area. So this diagram acts as a springboard for a series of the next set of slides that speak about that periphery outside of the core that shows movement, that we don't always capture in construction documents or in a core sample. And they include things like the body, movement, stasis, and representation, which is a key part to that. So the, the start of this next area, when we think about capturing anything in motion. Um, usually we're doing that every day without realizing it. A lot of the time it's through making a video on our phone. We do this so easily, but at the same time there are many variables involved, but they've become less evident to the eye because of the ease at which technology has shrunk them. And so in this section, where I focus on the body in motion, how it's been captured, it's trying to bring some of those variables to the foreground. So it's about the movement, um, and once again, those peripheral elements outside of the core sample, and trying to find a way to make them objective. And this way, it's my way trying to get them into the construction document. Um, it is a lifelong process. We'll see how a building like that turns out. But a starting point for speaking about the body in motion can be found with these two images, and specifically with Marcel Duchamp's New Descending a Staircase, where the body is rendered as basic geometric forms captured in the language of cubism. And it shows multiple views in order to capture the way we piece together our understanding of objects in space. But a year later, he would question painting and art and the fissure between science and aesthetics. And Duchamp's work grew out of questioning the role of the artist's hand, which is more the subjective, and the translation of these maneuvers. On the right, a year later, he would produce the three standard stoppages, which I just saw at MoMA, and I was standing around them. I think the guard thought I was gonna like, do something. <laughs> but they were fine, they're all glassed in, you can't do anything. <laughs> but what he did was he actually put the body in motion to produce these. And he took three threads, one meter in length, and dropped them from a meter, from one meter high, and in this work, he's straddling the line between movement and stasis, but also chance and objectivity. And the chance part is what becomes really important to this. But each string belongs to the language of measure. They're each a meter long. And he adds in time, the length of time it takes to drop, but also gravity, which we can also work with. Everything's measurable, scientific. And they make it into the realm, he puts all these together, but they end up working with chance, because every time you drop one of those strings, it's gonna end up in a different way, even though he's working with the same set of variables at the start. So in some ways, it's breaking fundamental rules about working with so many measurable pieces, but then working with something in the end that is about chance. So once he had a few of these done, he outlined them on a piece of canvas and then used that to then make these three wooden templates. So in some ways, what he's suggesting is that the meter can remake space. Then in fact, it even reflects gravity in the process, which our you know, typical ruler doesn't reflect any gravity. So to me, it's right and wrong at the same time and there's a lot of slippages in that too, but it gives me hope that there's a way of rethinking some of the conventions, or at least drawing out where there's those slippages in our conventions. So Duchamp crosses the threshold back and forth between art and science, which in some ways is where the interior lies. It's between decoration and architecture. And this is one reason I point to this body of work, but also because of the inherent properties that come forward about the convergence of the unpredictability of the thread drop as equivalent to the unpredictability of always knowing how people will use a space, flow through it, even though as we work in interiors, we're supposed to be program these, programming spaces for predictability. So the next set of images are selected to build upon these ideas while moving them closer to the realm of the interior and the body. And this is done by taking some of the elements and bringing them forward that look at unpredictability, flow, the body, and measurement. 
So these are probably, or I hope, familiar to a lot of people. Um, before Duchamp began his three standard stoppages, the works of Edward Muybridge and Jules Etienne Murray began capturing the body starting in the late 1800s, and they did this by keeping the camera shutter open in order to capture movement. But equally important to this process was their need to integrate measurement as a means of grounding movement to objectivity. So Moybridge could have told his model to do this jump off the chair 50 times, and it could be very different each time, but in the general realm, it's gonna sh make that same shape of a jump. So there's something specific but general happening at the same time. And later, Moybridge would also start integrating a grid in the background as a way of gauging where the figure is and being able to map it out, bringing some objectivity to it. Murray, on the other hand, was doing similar things, but he used a series of white lines and dots as a way of constructing another form of documentation. So you could follow it and almost see a template being constructed, in some ways almost sharing the same language as Duchamp where chance, movement, gravity, and measurement are all playing leading roles. And then a little bit after their photography experiments. Um, these two are little less known, but Frank and Lillian Gilbreth are industrial designers, and they would develop a body of knowledge about human motion in their publication titled Applied Motion Study. And they applied points of light to the end of a finger to track motion as the hand underwent a repetition of arabesques. So it was about seeing what repetition work would look like as they track it. And for them, the grid would also show up again as a way of grounding the fluid motion. And at some point, they became so versed at working with these that they started setting up their own set of dashed and dotted lines, or sometimes it would start looking like a complete straight line. So this image will come back in a few more slides, but I do want to move on to a few other people that are also working and trying to capture the moving body. So in another publication titled Measuring Space and Motion, Jane Callahan and Katherine Palmer used a similar technology of points of light where they photographed a model putting on stockings with front and side views. So lights were attached to her head, hands, elbow, feet, and back. That's why you're seeing so much movement in there. And all of these while she's putting stockings on in the dark as a means of recording the path of light. And at the same time, we can also see this as the precursor to motion capture technology. So I think they both were really on the track to something. They were just way ahead of their time doing this in the 40s. And from what I can tell in this publication, Jane Callahan was absolutely obsessed with documenting the body. And in this one example, she's showing how a woman is you know, washing her hair and the process of leaning down in the sink and then lifting her head back up. And because of the technology being used, it could really only capture you know, the woman making these movements every few seconds. It wasn't fluid the way that we can do it now, even though that fluidity can actually break down into distinct moments. But she tried to make this into a three-dimensional form out of the two dimensions, and she even understood where there were areas that just couldn't work in her process. And in another version, she shows a man getting dressed, and I love this one because it's just a very simple outline. And it's kind of like when you're in a change room, changing room and like you're working within the confines of trying something on um, versus when you actually have the full extent of space that you need. That's what she's trying to capture. And once again, trying to make a three-dimensional model from these, and they end up being these very you know, odd forms. And she worked with all materials, everything from clay to wire, like just kind of you know, was trying to get at something but just couldn't figure out how to get there. And I think it's because for her, the technology just wasn't there yet. But when we look at where we are now, Francois Brumont, who's a French designer and has a practice in flexions, worked with a ceramicist at the Ying Museum. And what they did was he used an infrared camera to record and track and interpret hand gestures of the ceramicist doing a throwing process to design a plate. And so these gestures were transformed in real time into a three-dimensional graphic landscape on the computer screen. And the data was then converted into graphics that were then applied to some final platters that they worked on in ceramics. But you can get a sense of if 
Jane Callahan were around now and met with Francois Beaumont, it'd be the perfect match and she would be really happy. So a little too late for her, um, but I'm glad to see that this idea of the dots using points as a way of mapping and tracking is something that's so embedded in this process that we just kind of can't let go of it because it's the way of bringing information that seems fluid to a measurement. So in the next slide, um, this one makes me a little sad that this is where we've ended up um, with graphic standards. So after all of these studies that have happened where we've seen how you know, the body is doing so many other motions and it's so fluid and you can track you know, so many details within it, when you finally end up with where these guys are, and I feel so bad because you know, like this is like Henry Dreyfus who's just phenomenal and Niels de Frint, like they're so important. But it just kind of makes me a little deflated that like this is what we use. So, you know, the dotted line comes back a little bit where you can see at the top of their head, like just slightly underneath. Like if you're this tall, you'd be here. If you're this tall, you'd be here. So it's, you know, maybe this is one of those areas that I'd like to see the change happen. But I also want to return back to that set of dash dotted solid lines that the Gilbreths were working on and place that side by side to a set of notations that we typically use in construction documents um, or in our architectural drawing that helps us make space. We know that we use certain types of lines for a column grid, certain types of lines for things that are hidden, open to below, um, just kind of that whole range. and. In that, the funny part that always comes through is the dash or the dot, which somehow says something's you know, not exactly there, it's kind of there, but not fully there. And to me, that's the interesting part. Like we've built it into our drawings to say, there's something a bit chancy going on, um, and we're gonna find a way to make a notation out of it. But there's been other disciplines where that's just been inherent to it. So even with the previous image showing the slight change in height of the figures, um, I like showing these two images because with the image on the left, the dashed line is a notation that represents hidden elements. And we can see this in this, this sleeve of a Parisian tailor's um, drawing a template for a sleeve, where the dashed line at the far top part of that gives instruction to the tailor. But in the final version, the dashed line disappears, much like it does in many of our transitions from construction document to the built work. The dash, dash line is not there. So it disappears into the fold and is hidden. And the important part of this is that in the language of apparel construction, the dashed line gives instruction and tells the tailor how to fold the sleeve garment from the smallest size that you can make, which is the straight line below it, up to the largest size, which is where that outer dot dashed line is. So versus its use as in architectural drawings where it's only representation, it's not instructional. So there's another slippage that says, well, how can that dashed or dotted line change the way that we're even conveying information in those drawings? And then on the right is a garment by Comme de Garçon, um, which there was an amazing exhibit at the Met last year, which I went through twice. And this is not Comme de Garçon, but I pretend it is. <laughs> I have to just pretend. But in it, it reveals folds and folds of fabric that are tightened back to the body through linear stitches that run horizontal and vertical. The only way I figured this out was by standing there and drawing it and figuring out where all the stitch lines were. And that's one way of starting to understand something better. It's not just the image, but you actually have to start drawing it. So, and it's kept horizontal and vertical, much like a grid. So the stitches are neatly contained, sometimes hiding the folds of fabric as they are compounded. And the stitch itself, with its repetitive puncture through the fabric, it mimics the dashed line of architectural and apparel construction documents. So, at this point, I do want to just read a short quote um, from an essay by Alexei Kukulievich, who writes about Duchamp's three standard stoppages because it ties back to apparel construction. So he writes, Duchamp claims that the notion of a stoppage occurred to him while on a stroll on the Rue Claude Bernard in Paris when he encountered the sign stoppage above a tailor's shop. In French, stoppage has both the sense that it has in English of coming to a halt and the additional meaning of being an invisible mend. The, pl 
play of sense within the French word stoppage no doubt suggested to Duchamp that the meter itself, the standard of standards, seems to have been something tailored. And so continuing on with, these are my last two tailoring slides, but the static body is captured through templates, through drawings. Um, in this case on the left, it shows up in this conforming device by William Bloom, um, Pollock. And what he's seeking to do is smooth out the body along its contours. It takes the wrinkles and folds out of loose clothing, like the previous one, and instead forces the device to build a simulcra of a topography, once removed from the original, being the body, but evident in the conforming device. So you can imagine when the conforming device comes off, <coughs> placed somewhere else, it picks up the representation of the body. And on the right, and these are also, I should explain, two images that also follow me, like they just kind of find a way into a lot of the things that um, I see in interiors. And on the right, Monica Wyatt also seeks to smooth out the body, but needs to expand the contours when she makes this map through these interstitial pieces that help flatten it out. So it's really cheesecloth, just to let you know what that is. <laughs> and as much as the grid is part of the map of the body, so are the interstitial forms, almost as if they're their own set of templates, much like the previous templates that we we're looking at. So up until this point, um, I've been talking a lot about folds, and I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about wrinkles, <laughs> not just face cream wrinkles, <laughs> but even though there is a hand up there. But I think it's important to um, look at these surfaces and how they change. And these are two images from the collection of the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. And they are photographs from the late 1800s titled Shriveled Apple and Back of Hand. And they're both included in a book titled The Moon Considered as a Planet, a World, and a satellite from two engineers who wrote in the late 1800s, James Nasmith and his co-author, James Carpenter. And the reason they brought these two photographs together was to explain the formation of the moon's surface due to geological changes underneath it. And in the book, they have all these beautiful plaster models that they tried to make of showing the moon's surface. Um, they're they're kind of cute, like in a funny way, because they're so ridiculous that they're made out of plaster trying to show the moon. Um, but these images are nice because they're actually real and explain what they're trying to get to. So they understood that with volcanic activity, you have lava, you have things happening underneath the ground, and we know this also just from Earth. Once all that comes out, what happens on the surface is that it shrinks a little, but it also wrinkles. And that's where you get this change that happens from what happened underneath changing, being diminished, and it causes the outer surface to reflect it. So, you know, that's kind of a big leap to think about the relationship of interior, exterior, but I think it does start to forge that relationship, even at the scale of building. So the intent for them was to convey how the changes below the surface affected the outer surface causing wrinkles. And they sought to place this concept in layman's terms by situating it within a familiar scale to the body. So the authors describe the hand and apple in the context of wrinkle theory as a long-kept shrivel apple affords an apt illustration of this wrinkle theory. Another example may be observed in the human face and hand when age has caused the flesh to shrink and so leave the comparatively unshrinking skin relatively too large as a covering for it. Um, so we do actually lose water in our body from the time we're born to when we die. We lose like a significant amount, I'm not gonna tell you, it gets sad. <laughs> um, but that explains a lot about wrinkles. <laughs> so for them, they were interested in trying to explain this larger concept, but through things that were more immediate. And that's something that I do wanna keep pulling through the rest of um, the presentation, is this change in scale, where there's a greater, larger concept, but we can see it play out in multiple scales. And one place that happens is with the folds of fabric, or maybe the wrinkles of fabric. I never know what the difference is between a fold and a wrinkle. I'll find out one time. But what happens is, 
in these examples, maybe I'll start with the bottom right. Um, it's an image, just a very simple diagram of a sine wave, and in some ways that captures kind of the, the most fundamental picture we can of something that can contract, expand, contract, expand. That's the role of a sine wave. It does it beautifully, perfectly. And then above that is a set of drawings that are just showing a curtain, a theater curtain in plan, you know, does the same thing, expands, contracts, expands, contracts. Um, we also see things like that happening with a few more of Moybridge's images where the moving body is causing material to change over the course of the body's movement. And then lastly, the one on the left is an image of draped cloth on a sculptural Greek figure rendered out of stone. And so that's where it becomes static, but it's meant to imply that it actually looks like it could just fall away from the sculpture. And that was what the artist's intent was, was to make it seem as, as if it had the potential for change. And one person's work that I like to look at is Ned Kahn. He's an, un, an environmental artist, and um, I strongly suggest that you look at his website. It's really beautiful. But he does a lot of these environmental pieces where there's grids, and then he attaches um, pretty small aluminum panels that are hinged at the top. And then, you know, it's dormant until wind comes through. And once wind blows through, you start getting this sense of, oh yeah, the curtain, the fabric, the fold, the sine wave. And these things become visible when normally we wouldn't see wind moving across these surfaces. So it's that role of, you know, going back to the beginning um, about materials that are flexible, how to build flexibility in to be able to show this movement that takes place that sometimes is not always just human, but it's also other forces that react upon them and change them. But for the other side of that, it's also looking at capturing what can be fluid, but then made static. And this is work by Mark West with a lab called CAST at the University of Manitoba. Mark is no longer at the University of Manitoba, but CAST is still there. So if anybody wants to come out to Winnipeg, they'll be glad to show you around. I've been there three times. <laughs> I've been there then more, like more than Canadians have been there. <laughs> I'm not Canadian, so I'm kind of proud of that. I really am. <laughs> so, um, but what he does is, I mean, Mark's brain to me is like one of the smartest specimens around, but he understands the forces on textiles and works with them to be able to capture them and cast them. And so that's what they do in this building. And you can see even in the middle image that he employs the role of the dashed line as a way of showing the forces of how the surface, you know, the fluid surface is then gonna be turned static and then released from the fabric. And so this is part of his design process in this. So um, with all of that, hopefully that helps bridge into this next section where I'd like to show you some student work. And then following that will be three projects that are at a much bigger scale that are connecting Ryerson to Toronto. And since you know, I bring all these things to my students, um, I feel like it's, yeah, it's a lot of talking about theory and concepts, but it means nothing if we can't actually make something from it. So I'd like to give them assignments where it's making from those ideas. And so I give them assignments where we're casting, folding, pleating, um, working with all of these layers. Sometimes it stays at the realm of the body, but I do ask them to think about how it would begin to transition into the built scale of the interior. So one place I like to start is with this project. It's a shirt alteration project that I give my students, and usually it's a warm-up exercise. And it has a lot of rules, and it's very methodical, because I wanted them to understand how to draw out a set of rules for a project, because when I hear students talk about their projects, they come up with a rationale of, well, I did this because I liked it. I'm like, no, that's not enough for me. So I make them figure out a, a logic as a way of coming to a conclusion where Hopefully, in the end, they'll still say they like it. But it lets them find a way of getting there where they may have not known that was how they were gonna get there. So in this example, um, Natanya had to alter her shirt 
and I ask them to alter the shirt where they have to use or develop some system that goes from the large shirt to something that's fitted to the body. And they can use anything that comes from understanding their bone structure, um, kind of anything that's about the body that's measurable, you know, they can take measurements, or working from the shirt itself and understanding the seam lines, how things are constructed. So Natani kind of broke the rules, but that was okay, it was fine, because it ended up still fulfilling what it should be doing. But she cast her body in plaster as a means of making the oversized shirt underneath fit her body, so she did make it fit. And on the inside of the shirt, the part you're not really seeing, but maybe you could see a little bit through her drawing, are the folded layers that happen on the inside, like essentially just got scrunched underneath what ended up being the smooth surface on the outside. So in some ways she was once again smoothing out the wrinkles but capturing them on the inside. So a little bit like where Nazmith was trying to go with seeing how things change from the inside to outside, it can also happen at the scale of the body um, in a different way. What I also like about this project is that it goes directly from working with a soft, flexible material to something that is what we understand to be static, such as plaster. And then another student, um, so I backed the project up a little bit, tried something different this year in my seminar. We do this in a theory seminar. And I had students cast part of their body to begin with and use that cast in a set of drawings to then figure out how they would alter the shirt. So this student, through drawing the cast in relationship to the shirt, started coming up with a series of folds, which then led to this shirt being folded up and one of the rules was it still had a fit when they put it on, so she got it over her head and that was pretty much it. Um, that's not her body, that's, she borrowed a different body for the casting. And then in another one, um, the student cast the sternum chest area and started understanding the undulations that happen by the collarbone. And this one just shows the direct relationship from the plaster cast of the body and integrating that undulation into a small scale plaster model that was meant to carry over those same attributes. So the idea also was for it not to just look like that, but it's about the attributes, those underlying forms or ways of working that are meant to inform how to make it. And that's always a really difficult thing to try to get across. But when I teach a design studio, I like to give students information like this, like to give them a roadmap of where we're going. And this would be almost the next step um, in that process. And we talk about just fundamental things that students have to work with. And I like to categorize two major pieces as performance, where those are precedents, and I don't mean precedent like, you know, Villa Savoie, but a precedent is a curtain or a clothing or upholstery. It's a form, it's like the objective of what Le Corbusier would look at. And a program is not just retail, commercial, but it's about how something you know, might fit or its function. So it tries to get a little bit underneath that surface. And with form making, we talk about tools, and I like putting these together because you can make the same set of forms with a sewing machine, a drill press, and a laser cutter. Um, with form work, you can use anything from mannequins, molds, to vacuum press. And materials, we don't talk about them as wood or concrete, but things that are pliable, castable, formable, drapeable. And this is the fun part when I like to ask my students to choose one from each category and then make something from that. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's a clear roadmap. They can't say, I don't know where to start. It's like, no, no, you do have a place to start. Now make it. So it, you know, it, it doesn't give them the chance to have the preconceived idea of this is what I'm gonna make. It's gonna look exactly like this. It's like, no, you don't know what it's gonna look like. So let's take these steps along the way and figure out what it will look like. Um, and these are just examples. I let them come up with other examples as well, but these are just some that I give them. And so just a, you know, a, trying to show one of these projects would take a bit longer. So this is just a quick one showing how one student um, took some of these ideas and moved it from that shirt process where she began with 
using a, mo a smocking um, stitch plus ironing and you know smoothing things out. But while she was doing that, she realized that there were pleats, there were folds, the material sometimes was layered up more, other times it wasn't. And she used that as a way of thinking about materials. The material changes in their different properties, but still allowing the same stitch to just kind of barrel across all of them. So what you're seeing in the plan is, and I know I'm going through this really fast, um, but it's usually a much bigger project. But in this project, she can barely see, but there's a little red dashed line that separates those bottom classrooms. This is the third floor of our building at Ryerson. And it separates classrooms that we like to have on the quieter side from all the noisy stuff that's happening on the other side. So she assigned different materials to be part of this curtain that would be moving along or be located along that classroom side to help bridge some of the noise and activity happening. So it's really about working with the properties of felt that helps with acoustics or a sheer material that helps with more visibility to look down a hallway. Um, and so it was really about trying to figure out how to connect all of these pieces together. But at this point I'd like to move into much larger projects that are happening at Ryerson with interior design. So these are three installations. The first one um, is the Bodishu Museum, and the last two are located in the same um, building. It's a historic landmark building in Toronto, and I'll go through and give you some of that background information. But in 2014, the School of Interior Design and the Architectural Science Depo Department were contacted by the Badashu Museum. And the Badashu Museum, they're um, located in Toronto in a very great spot that is almost the, the threshold to the University of Toronto. And they asked us to design their street front windows for their 20th anniversary. And the museum, it's a really important part of the city. It's one of the first kind of big museums that came along. I mean, there's always been the Royal Ontario Museum, which has the big addition now by Daniel Liebskind and other things with Frank Gehry. It's kind of changed a lot in the past 15 years, but this was one that you know, I feel like really landed in the city and really changed things. So they have a set of windows that wrap a really um, busy corner and they use that just as a way of showing who they are, what they do. And when you think of shoes, you might think like, oh, like they're just a shoe museum. But they frame, like the curators frame them in such a smart way. So they have the shoes on display, but they talk about what was happening at that time. And they have shoes that span the Middle Ages, which is unbelievable, all the way up to the present with shoes. You know, they even have some by Elton John, so that's kind of cool. Um, you know, the great Canadian Terry Fox, they have one by him. And they also have the largest Inuit collection, which nobody else has. And they worked really carefully with First Nations to be able to get that collection. So we spent, there were four students from interior design, four from architectural science, there were three faculty guiding them and we all got together and the curator to the museum, um, you know, walked us through the collections but we kept coming back to this image as why looking at just the shoes are important. It's an image taken by Alfred Eisenstadt who captured that famous kiss of a Marine. You know, he grabbed the nurse after, um, at the big parade celebrating the end of World War II. And it's about the gesture and the foot stance that the shoes are actually the artifact of the moment. So this is, this is part of the archives. They don't really let people in there unless you have an in. And I kept like trying to find a way to go back because <laughs> I could have just stayed there. I have a shoe problem, I will admit it. So it's a really um, just kind of a whole history within these archives. And so we started, you know, just documenting, looking at different shoes, getting the history of them from the curator. At the same time, we were just doing collages, trying to figure out, okay, where do we begin with this? And I should also mention these last three projects also bring back the idea of the body moving, um, moving through space and trying to capture it, but at the scale of installations. So this is just a quick you know, sketch that we were trying to do, showing feet moving across the windows. Um, there's a few maps in there, which you can kind of see a little. We started looking at profiles of shoes and learning more about the era, the time, but also understanding just the general shape of them, thinking about how how one would walk in them um, because shoes really did change the way people walked. 
So after selecting a set of them, we sought to translate the historical artifacts into a contemporary language using digital tools. And the synthesis resulted in a translation of shoe profiles that were selected from the historical eras, and we wanted to model them using fabrication software. So we knew we had great facilities to work with that we have at our schools, and wanted to use that as a way of making the installation. So we decided to take the shoe, the center line of it, and use that as a datum line, whereby the topography, the, shoe, the topography of the shoe elevations were gauged against the new datum line. So the shoe profile was translated as a displacement vector field that corresponded to a set of measured dowels of varying lengths that became our main material to reconstruct the profile, and that would fill the full length of the gallery window. And so the two images here are showing some of that modeling um, and this curve that happens as it, the window wraps a corner at the, the two intersecting streets. So with our team, um, and it was, whoops, let me go back to there. We had over 13,000 dowels. <laughs> um, didn't seem like a lot at the time until we counted them. And they ended up just being varying lengths that we put onto four by eight panels. And that was just the easiest way to work, knowing that we were gonna have to move the 21 panels by you know rented van, um, over many trips between the school and the museum, because it then spanned 25 meters across the street front. I should say what it is in feet to this audience, but I'm borrowing my Canadian <laughs> notes, <laughs> 25 meters. Um, so this was part of the process. We also ended up embedding LED lights in the background. So those four by eight panels were actually just frosted plexiglass, but we had to use some kind of lighting or else at night it would just go dark and we didn't want to use the lights from the gallery because it just wouldn't illuminate it the way that we needed to. So there's the um, LEDs that got put in in the background, and then finally before we took off all the craft paper from the windows, this was just standing at the corner to capture, you know, one that is the boot, one that is a shoe on the other side, and finally the um, opening when we took off all the craft paper. And there were a few videos in there as well that were just a nice compliment that were made, and it showed, there was one shown for each of the four seasons, and the videographer placed a camera at street level and just captured people walking by. And so you, in the summer you would see summer shoes, in the winter you would see the boots. So it was a nice way of showing <laughs> a little bit of movement in there too. But the hope is that we wanted that transition of all the dows to be able to capture this idea, almost like Moybridge, where there was that fuzzy area of the person jumping, that there's still the fuzzy area of the shoe moving. So in these next two projects, um, they're both, they, they took place during our design week in January. Every January there's a big festival called the Toronto Design Offsite Festival, and it's where a lot of great institutions open up their doors, they have juried selections of artists, architects, designers, installing projects, and the Gladstone Hotel is a real, um, it's just a well-known hotel in the city, especially because the owner is a big supporter of the arts. And so she clears out rooms, which is unbelievable, and has the juried group of designers come in and put installations into all of the rooms. It's like phenomenal. I mean, I shouldn't say all of the rooms. There's still some people who, there's some people that live there and she <laughs> doesn't bother them. Um, and they just, you know, go in and out of their rooms. It's, it's an interesting place. But a colleague and I, Andrew Furman, um, who I teach with, we decided to work with the theme that they had that year called transplantation. And we thought about that as how somebody moves across a landscape, moves from one place to another, physically moving up and down contours. At the same time, we also want to think about what else is something personal that moves across a landscape. And we started thinking about just the individual role of an envelope that goes out into the world, even though it represents somebody, but goes someplace else. So we started looking at a site called the Don Valley, and it's an area in Toronto that's just east of central Toronto, but it's a valley, and it's quite extreme. If you've been to Toronto, hopefully you know it. It's a really beautiful area. 
And at one point, they started building up bridges to connect the two, which really changed, changed the way Toronto worked. So the, in this case, you're seeing um, an image from the Toronto archives showing one of the bridges being constructed. It's also part of a writing that was included in one of Michael Andache's books, In the Skin of a Lion. He's also the author of The English Patient, which probably may sound more familiar to some people because the movie was so good. <laughs> but we started looking at the landscape as a series of, you know, just very straightforward sections through a landscape and wanted to think about how the body could engage that landscape. We wanted to think about bringing the outside to the inside. And the easiest way was just to work with these slivers. And we started building them up more and more. Um, at one point we decided, okay, what is our material? And it made sense that it became just a standard number 10 envelope. And we chose vellum envelopes just because of the translucency, because we knew we were gonna do something with light. Um, we knew that bringing the landscape to the inside was not as simple as taking some dirt and plunking it down on the floor in the room. It just wasn't gonna happen that way. We had these beautiful topographies. We knew that we wanted people to move through them. We knew they couldn't step on them. So we decided to invert it and make it become something that was hung from the ceiling. So this is just showing some of our process, um, building up the envelopes, and at some point it just became a grid. Like that grid always seems to come back and help ground things that could have flow or movement to them. So in our workshop, we just started building this up, testing them. Um, every time you test it, it's just like, is it gonna work or not work? Where's the failure gonna be? <laughs> it was kind of wait for that. And we also saw that patterns were starting to come forward in this, like things that we didn't expect. And I think to me, that's always the best part of a project are things that you don't expect to happen. So this is the Gladstone Hotel. Um, the second floor is where the biggest kind of commotion happens where all the rooms are um, having installations put in. We had room 202, and when we arrived, it looked like this. They had everything cleared out, and our project folded up so nice and neatly. Like, it was, it was more of a hassle to bring the ladder in than the actual project. So, envelopes, really great, good material to work with. Um, you know, they became everything that we had to sketch our notes on. That became our construction document to figure out where we were dropping our frame from the ceiling so we could have these four rods hold up all of the different sections. And this is just showing section after section after section getting added and built up until, and that's Drew lying down. Like every time we do something, he has to lie underneath it. <laughs> it's just standard. But it ended up becoming um, more cloud-like than landscape-like, which we didn't also really expect. And we're pretty sure the glue in the envelope is what gave it the pink glow. <laughs> we don't know, but we're assuming that. And at the same time, from different views, it started recalling the way that tailors use their patterns and hang them up. So if you've ever seen somebody who actually does work with apparel construction, those patterns just, they just hang them up. It's a really like beautiful way of working with drawings. Um, a few more views, it was you know with at the right height so people could walk through it. Um, just a few more views of that. And the moments where we left a little gap between each of the envelope is where it got a little bit more illuminated. And then the last project that I'll show you was with myself and three students um, who were just about to graduate. And they came to me and said, we really wanna do this, we want you with us on this. And I was like, oh my God, more work? Okay, we're gonna do this. And we put in a proposal, um, it got accepted. We, and this is a group that, like these, these three students, they just, they're very quiet. Like I think they just wanted to, you know, cast like small little details and do something very Rachel White Reed like and put a small little plaster, you know, mold on a wall. Um, they're very much like that, like very kind of quiet, ghost-like, you know, things. And, and instead the curators gave us the hallway, which is where the party is, where the DJ is, where all the drinks are. We're like, oh my God, like three people that, you know, the three students, 
myself where I'll just, I didn't expect, we just wanted a little room where we could do something. So we started looking at it and realizing that it was gonna be filled with people, especially on opening night. So there were a few parameters we had to put into place. We knew that it, once again, had to be a ceiling piece that people could walk under. Um, so that way things wouldn't be knocked around or people wouldn't trip over anything. At the same time, we wanted it to gauge people's movement. We wanted it to somehow register people below. Um, so those are a few pieces that we were trying to work with. Oh, and that we had, we, it was gonna be a big party piece. That was the other piece we had to account for. So we, you know, we populated the drawing with people. You probably can't see the two kissing off to the bottom right. <laughs> um, we knew that might happen. And we started looking at things that are festive. So we looked at Mexican pinatas, which are these beautiful, almost star-shaped forms. Um, and thought about just repeating the cone. And we added a bit of undulation to the ceiling because you're actually looking down a hallway and we wanted to have some kind of flow to it so it didn't just feel flat in that space. So we started constructing a set of what we were calling pinatas um, using mylar, lots of mylar, um, lots of temp templates, and then the structure of it included these red ribbons that would help with the cone that was actually constructed in two pieces. There's the upper part and then a lower part that just friction held it in place. And then on the inside, like how often do you get to use a lifesaver as a detail? It became a detail. <laughs> because we knew that we wanted people to pull the string and have party favors fall away with the bottom part of the cone because it's a party. So we had all these details going in place um, and we did have candy and other fun things at the bottom of these pinatas. Um, and so it was designed so people would pull them and this is the ceiling starting to get constructed. We used an iridescent paper just to help give it a, another quality of color and light to it. And then finally, you're looking at two different ends of it where it goes from this kind of reddish glow to a bluish glow. You know, we did work with a lighting consultant because we knew that if the whole ceiling was filled with these, we had to think strategically about how light would work. And then as you move from one end to another, we also planned it so the light would change. And um, we did have an army of like, you know, first year students helping us. <laughs> it's always good to recruit them <laughs> when you need them. And at the bottom of each of the cones, we had these little tags made so people would know, you know, that they are actually supposed to interact with the ceiling. So we put a few different times on them. At, there were three different times. One was, I think, you know, it says pull me, you know, 9.30, 10, 10.30. And we weren't quite sure if people were actually gonna do that. So at 9.30, people were standing underneath it and they're all kind of waiting. And then somebody does a countdown, and like all good Canadians, they just, like they do what they're told and they're all polite. <laughs> like it's, it's amazing, they're just, they're just so great, they're great. So that, you know, they, they pull it and then at the second round, Ryla in the bottom left, you know, the woman who looks like she's about to crack up laughing, finally got the microphone from the DJ because he was like, you've got to do the countdown. So, so we did the countdown and did the second pull. And then by the end of it, um, that's when all three pulls were done and stuff was falling out um, and it changed. Like we, you know, it changed quickly over that hour, but then we also want to, to think of it as a topography that registered change. You know, once again, it's a different kind of topography, one that people are changing. So we started pulling out some of the material just to get it to the full transformation of what it would look like without the material inside of it. So slowly over the course of the evening, that became a whole other project that we undertook um, until it started looking like this. So this is where you can tell how that lower part of the cone, just, you know, friction was all it took to keep it in place. And one of the last views of it, we couldn't get every little piece out, but um, one view where we ended on that project. So hopefully this is a way of, you know, I, I try to curate these three projects as a way of almost linking back to the very beginning, which is thinking about how we move through space, how we change it, you know, where there's opportunities for slippages to happen to kind of capture these motions or these movements, um, and hopefully in some ways start making the typical set of construction documents more dynamic and building a way to do that. 
So with that, my required slide, <laughs> any questions? <laughs> I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Saw one question. <laughs> Thank you for the lecture. Um, so uh, I'm in integrated design too here, and we're uh, constantly being uh, asked about our, our programs, about what we're doing on the inside of our, our buildings. So I was wondering, um, there's been talk about overlapping program, uh, and I was wondering <laughs> strategies that you've encountered or would like to share that, you know, how, how do you deal with overlapping program? Yeah, I mean, that's like, that's the core of what I love doing. <laughs> um, and to me, the test is always, you know, what is in some ways core to a discipline? Like, what are the things that are so fundamental to it where you can start finding connections between them. And to me, that's where it, it provides those slippages for things to happen. So, you know, I do talk a lot about um, construction documents or the dotted line. To me, that's one of those areas that I feel like I haven't even had a chance to explore yet. But, you know, it's something that shows up at the scale of architecture, interiors, but also construction for clothing. And so where else can that dotted line or how can it be used as a way of linking different projects. I mean, one of the hard parts is always shifting scales, like knowing when that shifting happens. Um, so that student that had the plaster you know, piece uh, over the shirt, like yeah, it fits on the body, but how do you bring that to the scale of a wall or the scale of furniture? And that's where you know, I would say, well, you have some of your variables in place. Maybe now it's about changing out the material or changing out the thickness of a material because gravity is now being played out in a whole different way. You know, for furniture, suddenly you have to think about the weight and force of somebody. Um, whereas with clothing, you don't really have to. And so to me, it's always about trying to find out what those variables are that can change things. Even at the scale of landscape, I was talking with a friend who has a practice in New York and um, their practice is called, um, I think it's tractor practice because he's so interested in the idea of traces and you know, even when a tractor moves across a landscape, it leaves its trace. It's just the memory of what was there, but the tracing wheel in clothing construction also leaves a trace. It, like the two things work at the same way, but totally different scale. So, but once you do shift scales, there's other variables that come in, and to me, that's where part of the answer is. Yeah, so I hope that helps. <laughs> Um, I'm also in integrated design too with Brad. Um, so my question to you is, have you ever come across a material that's um, kind of put you in awe and you wanted to use that material so badly that you let it determine the project for you? <laughs> <laughs> have you ever come across that material? <laughs> I think I have. Um, I mean, to be honest, like plaster to me is the one material that I absolutely love because it's a powder and then it's fluid and then it becomes static. Like it goes through all of these changes and it can change fast. And so you're kind of like, oh, okay, you know, did it happen too fast and what, you know, did it set too soon? Um, so that's why I'm always working with plaster in all different ways. Um, so that's another, I know Dean Taubman is also a big fan of plaster. <laughs> um, but one thing that I always tell students, <laughs> <laughs> Carl. But one of the things I always tell students is not to fight the material. Like I, that's, I think that's the other side of, of that question is I always see students fighting materials and they think they could take material and make it do something. At a certain point, it just doesn't want to. It's like, mm, it just, it has certain properties. It wants to work a certain way. And then it's a matter of saying, well, if it needs to, that's where that slide about how things perform, um, kind of all those different steps, to me that's where it's about, okay, well how does it need to perform? So how can you shape it so it does respond to that performance? And to me that's what starts informing how it should be shaped. It just needs more information to inform it. So that's what I would look at. Thank you. Yeah.
thank you for your lecture. I'm, I'm thinking back to um, the slides where you were talking about the various strata of conditions and also thinking about how increasingly interior conditions are filled with digital platforms, digital surfaces, technological engagement, and increasingly those are seen as those are seen as interior strata, so to speak. And I'm just curious, like, how you begin to think about or identify those within some of these paradigms mm -hmm. of time or flexibility or what have you. Yeah, I mean, see, that's a really great question, just because it's one of those things where, you know, when I previously mentioned how technology has just shrunk everything, like, to the point where it's become invisible. And so there's all these different, you know, ways that we occupy the interior that we just take for granted, that don't always render themselves visible. And to me, I think that's a great way of saying how do we begin to materialize those in some way that can make it visible. Um, I don't know what the answer is to that yet. Right now, I see it a lot in terms of how people are making things from that. So, for example, this symposium that we held in the fall was trying to get to that. It was trying to look at how people are using digital fabrication um, software to make the interior, or but we didn't really end up talking about how things were making the interior. Instead, it was all these other set of attributes that came forward, and um, we were just talking about this yesterday about authorship, you know, the role of the thumbprint, and where that, in, some, in a funny way, that's come back through, you know, just things like our phone. So that's starting to resurface, even though it's something that we kind of lost track of for a while. Um, but I also think of people like Virginia Sanfratello, who is just kind of making, 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 but it's also very object-based, whereas I think there's another way of looking at it, which is more of this kind of, um, sort of invisible way of making things. And that's where the work I showed by Francois Brumont, I think is really important because he's trying to say, well, there's craft and, you know, there's handcraft and digital craft. How can those two things come together? But through an intermediate layer, which is about tracking the body. So it's using tracking the body to then make something. And I think that's one output, but I think it's just the start of where things could go. Oh, across the seats, okay. Uh, so I just wanted to ask, I thought you, one of the things that you said that was like fascinating to me is you spoke about um, the apple and the hand, right? And how the interior affects the exterior so much. And I'm, I'm curious as an interior designer and designer or creative at large, do you see that that pushes up against the role of an architect? At, and you spoke about invisibility. So do you see like in the future, um, facades becoming hyper-transparent, even some of the work that you showed for your students was absolutely transparent, it was just the glass barrier, right? Mm -hmm. So yep. how, how, do you, um, how do you have that dialogue with the architect for uh, a proposed building, say, if you're like, well, no, it's all about the interior and what's going on in the interior, so open it up and let us see. I mean, maybe you can just like talk a little bit more about yeah. that. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, one person who always comes to mind is Petra Blaze, the textile designer, because she talks about how she designs everything on the outside of architecture and everything on the inside, but she doesn't design architecture. So she does landscape, she does curtains, you know, soft materials, and I love that, because it's like I'm not dealing with the architecture, but everything inside and outside. And so I think that's a really interesting position that she uses, but it is true, like I, I, I always have, you know, this discussion I feel like comes up a lot about where do you draw the line between interior architecture, like interior design, interior architecture, architecture, there's all those different, you know, levels of it. And in some ways I think it's more of what does the project call for? Like what, that might be the thing that actually drives the project. Um, I would love to see more things where the interior designer, you know, they engage the boundary but it's through, I think, the tactics of the way an interiors person works rather than trying to be an architect. Like, I wouldn't want it to be that way. It should be from their own set of knowledge that they have, because to me it is this whole other set of knowledge that they have that architects don't always have, because they're learning their own set of things over here. I mean, obviously there's crossover that happens, but I think it is through, you know, to me, like after teaching interiors for, I don't know how many years at this point, um, there really is a very specific kind of lens that I think an interior student comes through or that they see of the world 
that is different from the way somebody coming through architecture looks at it. And I think that's an important piece to hold on to because I think it does shape what does happen from the inside, kind of moving to the outside. Um, in the, at the end, I feel like it always comes down to, you know, what does licensure allow? You know, essentially it's the difference between what is load-bearing and what is not load-bearing. Like an architect can sign off on anything load-bearing, an interior designer cannot sign off on anything load-bearing, but they can also consult with somebody who can sign off. So it's, I think it's, you know, that part is, oh yeah, that's easy to take care of, but it's more of how the interiors person works that then shapes that boundary or that threshold between the two. Yeah, I hope that helps answer it or <laughs> gets to some of it. It's a, it's a big discussion, it's a big one. We don't live on the yeah. outside of buildings. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, in, um, like in, in the literature in, in um, people looking at it, indoor air quality, for both Canada and the U.S., it ends up being about 85% of our time is spent indoors. Like, it's phenomenal, like how much time we spend inside. And, and this is for, the, for you know, people who do indoor air quality. They're trying to make the argument that they should have more funding for the interior air rather than outside because of how much stuff is happening, like how much we are on the inside. Yeah, so it's not even just, you know, interior design discipline, but it's kind of other areas of people working in that space too. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> If there are no other questions, I'll ask a question. Um, or maybe share something first. I had a, we had a, an opportunity to speak with IBM, maybe last week or the week before, about Watson and artificial intelligence. And one thing that really, really mm -hmm. changed with the way that I was thinking about things was the ability to use data to start to customize things. And you talked a lot about customization. But the, we started joking, well, what types of applications could we use? And it's becoming advising season for us, how we match <laughs> students with their advisor. And we've always done it alphabetically, right? This is the way that we always organize things. But now, like in the, with the insight of, of, say, Watson or artificial intelligence, you could use all sorts of criteria to match a student to their advisor. And we're not there yet, so don't worry, guys. But, yeah, they're all freaking out. But, they knew who they were going to get. Now they don't. <laughs> but like, is it based on people's hobbies? Is it based on other types of criteria? But, but I think that I both love the, the uh, graphic standards. But then in the context of these types of things and in the way that you talk about it, all of a sudden, I hate graphic standards, right? Because and I guess the question is about how you start to find the balance between maybe abstraction and specificity and how you might be yeah. able to move between those because I mm -hmm. think, and I love the translation for you from maybe people that came long before a technology existed where they could achieve what they were trying to do. And so for so long we've taught students about abstraction and as a way to be able to speculate on certain things. But then I think we also show, mm -hmm. in, and in your point with graphic standards, that all of a sudden that obliterates maybe a true range that exists there, or there's an idealized version of something. And so maybe just mm -hmm. how that might play a role in the way that you're thinking about some of these things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would love to do a, you know, a re jump of Moybridge, or to be able to capture it through current technology, and you know, work with people who are doing motion caption imaging, just to be able to say, well, maybe these are the new set of templates. Especially as we're working more three-dimensionally with software, you can then plug in these templates and realize, oh, it's not just the two-dimensional, you know, images that link up to, here's our section cut, here's the plan cut, but if we're really looking at things three-dimensionally, how do we make a new set of templates for that? Yeah, but Canada won't give me the funding to do that. <laughs> I keep trying. Maybe the U.S. will. <laughs> we don't I know. Have I think. Apply, so. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for an incredible talk tonight. And amazing. Thank and you. To our Thank you for having me. Thank you.